Hello, and welcome to the turbulent world of Middle East soccer, or Mid-East soccer podcast. I'm your host, James Dorsey. Today, I want to discuss how sustainable the efforts in the Middle East are to reduce tensions. A written version of this discussion is on my blog at www.jamesmdorsey.net. The answer to the $64,000 question is probably not. It's not for lack of trying. Gulf states and Egypt have ended their debilitating three and a half year long economic and diplomatic boycott of Qatar. The UAE has moved at lightning speed to establish formal ties with Israel and repair relations with Iran and Turkey. Saudi Arabia is moving in the same direction albeit in a more plodding manner. Meanwhile, Turkey is also seeking to repair its long strained relations with Egypt and Israel. Recently, Saudi Arabia granted visas to three Iranian diplomats to represent the Islamic Republic at the Jeddah-based 57 nation organization of Islamic cooperation. In 2016, Saudi Arabia broke off diplomatic relations with Iran after its embassy in Tehran was attacked in protest against the execution of Saudi Shia activist and cleric Nimr al-Nimr. The recent granting of visas is expected to be followed by visits by officials to the two countries' shuttered embassies. Despite this, Ali Shihabi, an analyst with close ties to the Saudi leadership said, I understand that no real progress has been made, so there's no need to read too much into this. It was a goodwill Saudi gesture, particularly since the Organization of Islamic Cooperation is a multilateral organization, and they will be accredited to the OIC, not to Saudi Arabia. To be sure, Middle Eastern states need a dialing down of tensions to be able to focus on reform, diversification, and growth of their economies. To achieve that, they need to project an environment of regional stability, conducive to domestic and foreign investment. An equally, if not more critical driver, is uncertainty and fear about the United States' future commitment to Middle East security, with no obvious replacement for the region's long-standing guarantor. The uncertainty is compounded by a fundamentally unchanged regional insistence on the need for a foreign security underwriter. The Gulf states lack confidence in their own capabilities and fear that a strong military could threaten the survival of dynastic regimes, giving countries like Turkey and Iran a strategic advantage. Those regimes do not necessarily want very robust and very capable armies and militaries that become centers of power, said Middle East scholar Yasmin Farouk. If history is any indicator, Gulf uncertainty about US intentions may be exaggerated. A review of the last 50 years suggests that the Middle East has been there before and nothing much has changed. The U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan brings to mind the American withdrawal from Vietnam, after which Southeast Asia and the Middle East fretted about the possibility of the United States walking away from its commitments. Similarly, the toppling in 1979 of the Shah of Iran, an icon of regional U.S. power, caused heartburn in autocratic regimes much like the popular Arab revolts in 2011, which toppled US allies such as Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak as Washington kept its distance. To be sure, that was then and this is now. When America was defeated in Vietnam and the Shah was overthrown, the Cold War had long settled in as a fact of life. Unlike today's US-China rivalry, which has yet to find its moorings and guardrails. In some ways, what has changed is positive. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union and China sought to weaken and undermine US allies in the Middle East and supplant it as the dominant regional power. 
Today, they seek cooperation and share the goal of lowering tensions and induce, introducing some degree of stability. The competition is economic, focusing on technology, arms sales, oil, and investment. There is little interest, if any, in Beijing and Moscow to go much beyond that. Like the United States, neither China nor Russia wants to see a nuclear arms race in the region. The only player who can be effective and bring about progress in the Vienna debates is the only player we do not hear his position on the Iranian issue, and that is China. China's influence on Iran's policy is probably the biggest influence a foreign power can have over Iran. At no point in history did China have the opportunity to make such a contribution to world stability as it has today in Vienna, said Ephraim Levy, the former head of Mossad, Israel's foreign intelligence service. He was referring to talks in Vienna to revive the 2015 international agreement that curbed the Islamic Republic's nuclear program. The taunt in the Middle East would be fortified in an environment where the United States and China find common ground in their regional approaches. There is considerable divergence between Chinese and US approaches to the Gulf, but the interests of the two powers are largely compatible. Both want a stable region that supports their strategic and economic concerns. Given their deep cooperation with the Gulf monarchies and China's influence in Iran, there is an opening for Washington and Beijing to coordinate their policies in working toward a less turbulent Gulf region, said China Gulf scholar Jonathan Fulton, a scholar who studies China Gulf relations writing in Middle East policy. Academic and former Lebanese culture minister and United Nations negotiator, Rassan Salame argues that America cannot leave the Middle East only because it concentrates on China. Paradoxically, you need to be in the Middle East if you want to concentrate on China as a strategic rival, because if you look at where the oil and gas is going, it's going east. Nevertheless, Beijing's efforts to moderate Iran's tougher negotiating stance since hardline President Ibrahim Raisi took office have not stopped it from enabling a ballistic arms race in the Middle East. In what Chinese scholars have described as a collaborated effort to maintain a regional balance of power. Iran has rejected US, Saudi and Israeli demands to expand talks in Vienna to include ballistic missiles. US intelligence believes that recent satellite images show Saudi Arabia manufacturing ballistic missiles at a site constructed with the help of China. Saudi officials said the kingdom had built the manufacturing facility with the assistance of the Chinese military's missile branch, the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force. China has insisted that cooperation in the field of military trade did not violate international law or involve the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The United States has long refused to sell ballistic missiles to Saudi Arabia. Iran described the test firing of 16 ballistic missiles of different classes during a military exercise in late December as a message to Israel. It was a response to Israeli threats to strike at Iranian nuclear facilities if the Vienna talks fail or produce a result that Israel deems sufficiently unsatisfactory to justify unilateral action. 16 missiles aimed and, and annihilated the chosen target. In this exercise, part of the hundreds of Iranian missiles capable of destroying a country that dared to attack Iran were deployed, said Armed Force Chief of Staff Major General Mohammed Bahari. Beyond ballistic missiles, a breakdown in the Vienna talks with Iran could also ignite a nuclear arms race. Already, Israel has begun to imagine a Middle East inhabited 
by a nuclear Iran. Even if global powers manage to revive the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, diplomacy may only delay the inevitable. Given how resilient the Islamic Republic has proven to be, it seems that the world may eventually have to tolerate an Iranian nuclear bomb, just as, as it has learned to live with the Indian and Pakistani arsenals, said former Israeli Foreign Minister Shlomo Ben Avi. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has left no doubt that the kingdom would develop a nuclear weapons capability if Iran did the same. Media reports last year suggested that Saudi Arabia had constructed, with the help of China, a facility for extracting uranium yellow cake from uranium. Saudi Arabia denied the reports, but insisted that mining its uranium reserves was part of its economic diversification strategy. The Saudi energy ministry said it cooperated with China in unspecified aspects of uranium exploration. Cooperation on nuclear energy was one of 14 agreements worth $65 billion signed during Saudi King Salman's 2017 visit to China. The nuclear related deals involved a feasibility to study to construct high temperature gas cooled HTGR nuclear power plants in Saudi Arabia. Cooperation in intellectual property and the development of a domestic industrial supply chain for HTGRs to be built in the kingdom. Saudi Arabia signed similar agreements with France, the United States, Pakistan, Russia, South Korea, and Argentina to advance its pre-pandemic goal of constructing 16 nuclear reactors by 2030. Saudi Arabia established the King Abdullah Atomic and Renewable Energy City, which is devoted to research and application of nuclear technology. Concern about Saudi intentions has been fueled by Riyadh's hesitancy in agreeing to US safeguards that would require it to sign the additional protocol of the treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, NPT, even though it has not ruled out among other things. Meanwhile, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has insisted that it is unacceptable that nuclear armed countries are preventing his nation from developing nuclear weapons. The odds are stacked against avoiding a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. To do so would require agreement on a regional nuclear free zone. For that to happen, Israel would have to acknowledge its possession of nuclear weapons, something it has refused to do. While some Israelis have suggested that the reality of a nuclear Iran could persuade Iran, Israel to change course, there is no indication that the government is seriously considering doing so. A nuclear free zone would also demand a restructuring of security arrangements in the Middle East to include a security pact that would include all parties as well as an arms control regime. So far, that looks more wish like wishful thinking than anything parties would be willing to contemplate genuinely. More likely, countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Turkey will continue developing their domestic defense industries briskly. Moreover, any revival of the Iran nuclear accord would likely lift the ban on Iran's acquisition of conventional weapons, which in turn would accelerate the arms race as the Islamic Republic rushes to modernize and upgrade its military capabilities, which harsh sanctions have long hampered. Analysts and policymakers have so far focused on Gulf states' efforts to diversify their sources for arms acquisition, but largely overlooked their endeavor to expand the number of countries with bases in the region. So far, that has been limited to French, British, and Turkish bases, and a Chinese facility in Djibouti. In a potential setback, Sudan's military chief, General Mohammed Othman al-Hussein, 
has said his country was reviewing an agreement to host a Russian naval base on its Red Sea coast. coast. Meanwhile, various Gulf states are quietly looking at Asian countries like India, South Korea, and Japan to establish a more active presence in the region. Some analysts suggest that a rapprochement between Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Iran could alter the dynamic of a Middle East in which Israel has diplomatic relations with the Gulf and other Arab states. These analysts argue that Israel may see the detente as a threat to its emerging role as an anti-Iranian bulwark that would allow it to expand military and intelligence operations in countries from which it was either barred or limited in the deployment of its capabilities. While former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu used the notion of containing Iran as a primary justification for the Abraham Accords, the simultaneous warming of ties between Iran and Gulf states will ultimately dilute Israel's role, undermining its argument that Iran is a rogue state and, re and regional destabilizer, said scholars Mahjoub Zweri and Lakshimi Venugopal Menon. The UAE has sought to counter the potential threat of Iran, disrupting the Emirates', Emirates rapprochement with Israel by pledging that it would not allow the Jewish state to build security-related installations on its territory. The Emirati pledge, in a suggestion that some elements of Middle East detente may be more sustainable than others, did not stop UAE Air Force Commander General Ibrahim Nasser al-Alawi from visiting Israel, or the Emirati Navy from participating in a joint naval exercise with Israeli, Bahraini, and US vessels. Similarly, speaking at a conference in November 2021, Major General Amikam Norkin, the commander of the Israeli Air Force, suggested in reference to the UAE in Bahrain, the possibility of cooperation in anti-drone and ballistic missile defense. Israel could become a key player and asset for the countries that are under threat of Iranian drones, along with the develop developing needed strategic depth in the continuing campaign against Iran. Major General Norkin said, he appeared to be proposing the deployment of Israeli detection systems in the Gulf that would also work against ballistic missiles. Also, the UAE pledge did not disrupt UAE-Israeli cooperation to counter alleged Iranian hacking. ClearSky, a cybersecurity company, reported that a cyber group operated by Hezbollah, the Iranian-backed militia in Lebanon, had hacked the Emirates' Etisalat telecommunications company, as well as companies in Israel, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, the United States, and Britain. Nevertheless, Emirati nationalists and surrogates for the government painted the UAE's suspension of talks to acquire the F-35, America's most advanced fighter jet, because of conditions the Biden administration wants to impose on the sale as evidence of their country's newly gained clout and assertion of sovereignty. Buried under the bravado was the fact that close relations with Israel apparently did not exempt the UAE from a US-Israeli understanding to maintain the Jewish state's qualitative military edge. The administration's conditions reflected Israeli suggestions designed to prevent the sale from putting the Jewish state's edge at risk. At the same time, closer ties with Israel potentially complicate not only the UAE's burgeoning improved relations with Iran, but also its long-standing partnership with Saudi Arabia. The kingdom fears that the relationship could give the UAE an edge and a degree of greater independence from Saudi Arabia and enhance its ability to play one off against the other. Saudi Arabia unsuccessfully sought the cancellation of a UAE brokered energy and water deal between Israel and Jordan. 
the largest cooperation agreement between the two states since they agreed a peace, to sign a peace treaty in 1994. Riyadh wanted to replace the deal with one that would include it while excluding Israel. A burgeoning arms race and concerns that a failure by the United States, Europe, China, Russia, and Iran to agree in Vienna could significantly heighten regional tensions and provoke a military conflagration are just two of the powder kegs that could make Middle Eastern distant falter. In a review of 2021, Middle East scholar Ross Harrison noted that wars in Syria, Libya, and Yemen have created security dilemmas and conflict traps that made the hurdles to getting to cooperation insuperable, even for actors who might be predisposed to cooperate. Transitioning from where Syria is today to a more stable, inclusive, and demilitarized country free of outside actors seems years, if not decades away, Mr. Harrison noted. He noted further that two decades after ripping itself apart, Lebanon risked slipping back into civil war. The years from 2011 to 2021 and the civil strife they witnessed were shaped by revolution and counter-revolution. Leaders of eight of the Arab League's 22 member states, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Algeria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Sudan were toppled by popular uprisings. Possible political change was reversed or stymied in most, if not all, of the initially successful revolts by counter-revolutions. The counter-revolutions were often supported by the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. After General turned President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi came to power in a military coup in 2013, backed by the two Gulf states. While the bloody civil wars in Syria, Libya, and Yemen were the most extreme consequence, there is no suggestion that detente in the coming decade would give the counter-revolution pause. Add to that Palestine's gray swan. Israel may believe that it has successfully pushed the resolution of the Palestinian problem to the margins with the help of the UAE in Bahrain. But the question is not whether, but when Palestinian aspirations will come to haunt Israel and push themselves higher up the Arab and Muslim agenda. The question is how Israel will deal with the facts that occupation is unsustainable. Demographics are certain to threaten the Jewish character of the state and civil unrest stretching beyond the West Bank into pre-1967 borders remains a constant possibility. How Israel responds to these issues is likely to influence Arab and Muslim public opinion. So far, public opinion has been one reason for Saudi Arabia and others not to follow the UAE in recognizing Israel, even if the public expression of critical sentiments is severely curtailed, if not harshly repressed. Nevertheless, the quest for detente has not prevented countries that do not have diplomatic relations from being more overt in their contacts with Israel. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman held talks in Neom, his $500 billion pet project for a futuristic city with Mr. Netanyahu when he was still prime minister, despite the kingdom's refusal to recognize Israel. Qatar, which already helps Israel fund public salaries and relief operations in the blockaded Gaza Strip, concluded the diamond trade agreement with the Jewish state. The deal enables Qatar to join a select group of countries authorized to trade in diamonds. In return, it will allow Israeli diamond merchants to travel to the Gulf state, even though the two countries have no formal relations. The deal took on added significance because of UAE acquiescence. The Emirates have cooperated with Israel on diamonds for several years, 
and long opposed Guthrie attempts to join the exclusive Gemstone Club. Meanwhile, differences in attitude towards popular revolts, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, who is widely held responsible for war crimes that cost half a million lives, lie just under the surface, despite the lifting in January 2021 of a three and a half year long economic and diplomatic boycott of Qatar. Doha has quietly asked members of the Brotherhood who live there to relocate, but has not further tweaked its support for Islamists. A potential watershed could occur when the aging Egyptian Islamic scholar Yusuf al Karadawi, who is based in Qatar, passes on. Mr. al Karadawi, who is 95, has been a major influence in shaping Qatari policy since the country's independence in 1971, including the advocacy of greater rights for others that are not necessarily recognized at home. An autocracy, Qatar has supported the aspirations of protesters across the Middle East and North Africa and opposed the return of President al-Assad to the Arab fold in the hope that it would encourage Russia to help roll back Iranian influence in the country. Syria was suspended from the Arab League in 2011, at a time that Qatar, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia all funded groups opposed to the Syrian regime. There is no indication that those hopes have any base in reality. Iranian ground forces in Syria, together with Hezbollah fighters and Foreign Legion type units populated by Pakistani and Afghan Shiites, have ensured that the Russian intervention has so far been possible without inserting large numbers of regular troops. It has made the Russian intervention relatively risk free and low cost. For now, the taunt in the Middle East appears to have shifted rather than removed the battlefield on which regional rivalries play out. The UAE, widely seen as a leader in reducing tensions, has adopted a selective approach towards rapprochement. The UAE's diplomatic initiatives focused on Iran, Turkey, and Syria targets countries with which the risk of escalation outstrips the cost of reconciliation. Yet, plans by Emirati companies to invest in energy projects in Iran and Syria threaten to violate U.S. sanctions. The taunt has not persuaded the UAE to stop supporting insurgents in Yemen, surrogates in Libya, or supplying arms to Ethiopia in its war against Tigray. The long and short of it is that the rush to dial down tensions in the Middle East and North Africa rests on shaky ground. Except for Iran, which sees the frenzy of diplomatic and economic outreach as reaffirming its position as a major regional power, Middle Eastern states like Saudi Arabia and the UAE are driven by uncertainty and fear. Their moves are efforts to buy time to put their house in order and be prepared for a potential next round of differences, not an attempt to craft a baseline standard for a shared vision of the region's future. The moves are also aimed at keeping the United States engaged and an attempt at navigating the risky waters of big power competition that is necessarily ad hoc and short term and risks turbocharging a regional arms race with no underlying realistic long-term strategy. Saudi Arabia and the UAE see detente as a hedge to limit the fallout of a potential failure of the Vienna talks and a possible military confrontation between Iran and or Israel and the United States. Gulf hedging reflects a failure to recognize that perceptions of the US commitment rested on a misreading of the 1980 Carter Doctrine that successive US administrations opportunistically allowed to fester. The doctrine committed the US to defending the region against attacks by an external power. Read the Soviet Union.
that threat fell by the wayside with the demise of the Soviet Union. In the minds of several Gulf states, post-revolutionary Iran replaced the Soviet Union as an existential threat. The perception was reinforced by mounting hostility between the US and the Islamic Republic. US, Israeli, and Gulf opposition to Iran's nuclear program and Israel's changing threat perception, which, which viewed Iran rather than the Palestinians and the Arabs as its foremost existential challenge. The current situation is also a result of the US's failure to couple its security presence with policies to address the issues faced by the region's populations. Education, income distribution, public health, climate change, and basic rights. The frenzy to reduce tensions offers the United States a second chance to broaden its security and stability outreach to address issues that concern broad swaths of Middle Eastern populations and have forced themselves onto the agenda in recent years. Summing up the US policy dilemma in the Middle East in the words of the English punk band, The Clash, if I stay with, there will be trouble. If I go, there will be double. Middle East scholar John Altman suggested that the United States' failure to ensure that the Gulf states had realistic expectations and did not misread the Carter Doctrine encouraged them to act more aggressively and take bigger risks in the false belief that Washington would have their backs. The misperceptions persuaded the Gulf states to misread the Carter Doctrine as a guarantee that the United States would ensure the survival of their regimes and protect them against Iran unconditionally. Multiple US sanctions or lack thereof put paid to this interpretation, rattled the Gulf states and persuaded them to become reckless at times. The US's refusal in 2011 to prevent the toppling of Egypt's Hosni Mubarak, secret negotiations that led to the 2015 International Iranian Nuclear Agreement, President Barack Obama's notion of a Middle East that Saudi Arabia and Iran would share as hegemons, and the failure of the US to respond in 2019 to Iranian attacks on shipping in the UAE and oil facilities in Saudi Arabia were among the markers that were laid down. President Donald Trump's description of the 2019 strike in Abakek as an attack on Saudi Arabia and not an attack on us constituted a wake up call. Many analysts suggest that the Biden administration's refusal to spell out an unambiguous Middle East policy has had a positive effect. It produced the rush to dial down regional tensions. From an administration standpoint, this is a sign that US strategy is actually working, Mr. Altman said. That may be true in the short term. However, the United States will have to spell out an unambiguous, clearly articulated policy that outlines what commitments it envisions sooner rather than later. A clear policy would help Middle Eastern rivals manage their differences and focus on economic cooperation and trade. While the debate over US policy continues to rage in Washington, common ground is starting to emerge between proponents of the current US military posture and advocates of a withdrawal from the region. In the words of Hussein Ibish, a senior fellow with the Arab Gulf States in Washington Institute, this common ground involves a rethink of the distribution of its assets to make them more effective and where appropriate, smaller, leaner, and more flexible, while at the same time recognizing that long-term deployments of US forces in the Gulf region remain essential to the interests in, of the United States and those of its regional and global partners and for regional security and stability. Mitigating in favor of detente in the Middle East is the fact that it was not just uncertainty about the US commitment 
that prompted Saudi Arabia and the UAE to adopt a more conciliatory approach. The fact of the matter is that assertiveness, with few exceptions, such as the 2013 coup in Egypt, backfired. The UAE was forced to recognize that its ability to project military power beyond its borders was limited. A cost-benefit analysis produced a clear verdict. Saudi Arabia, and to a lesser extent the UAE, are trapped in a disastrous war in Yemen that has dragged on for almost seven years. Syria's Mr. al-Assad has the upper hand in a decade-long brutal civil war. Iran is encountering headwinds in Iraq, but remains a force there. The same is true for its ally in Lebanon, Hezbollah. Moreover, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon have demonstrated Iran's ability to achieve its objectives militarily rather than diplomatically with the help of non-state actors, despite international isolation and harsh US sanctions. There is also a question mark over the sustainability of efforts to reduce tensions, since Saudi Arabia and the UAE are the weaker parties in negotiations with Iran. Perceptions of US unreliability and suspicions that Washington may turn its back on the Middle East further weaken their position. This is compounded by the fact that Saudi and Emirati officials fundamentally do not believe that real accommodation is possible with Iran. There's a keen sense in the Gulf that the Iran problem never goes away. It's not about the Islamic Republic, it's about Iran, Mr. Altman said. Furthermore, dialogue has yet to produce more than a temporary lull at best, especially between Saudi Arabia and Iran. This pattern of dialogue has been underway for two years, or we've been leading up to it for two years, and yet it has not created anything meaningful in terms of outcome, said Iran scholar Sanem Vakil. The underlying fundamental tensions between Iran and the Gulf Arab states, and that between Iran and its external actors in the region remain unresolved, she said. The Saudi and UAE strategy amounts to a bet that the taunt against the backdrop of sustained social unrest in Iran, driven by economic hardship, will spark a policy change in Tehran. They are also hoping that Iran will accept that regime survival cannot be ensured by a stepped up security and repression exclusively. What we're hoping for is regime moderation, where we're dealing with Iran as another state that we can deal with and through which they can benefit from. So if they need leverage, they can get leverage, but it doesn't have to be through the military aspects. That's the type of change that has not been explored a lot, said Mohammed Baharun, Director General of Behuth, an independent public policy research center. Efforts by Middle Eastern rivals to dial down tensions and manage rather than resolve conflicts are fragile at best. Moreover, they raise the question of what the end goal is. For now, that appears to be primarily an endeavor to buy time, put their own houses in order, diversify their economies, and ensure that they remain competitive in the 21st century. The sustainability of detente in the Middle East will ultimately depend on support from the United States and other major powers, including China, Russia, Europe, India, Japan, and South Korea. It will also be contingent on economic cooperation and trade, raising the cost of a return to conflict to the point that it outstrips the benefits of confrontation. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. A written version of this podcast is on my blog, The Turbulent World of Middle East Soccer at www.jamesmdorsey.net. Please join me for my next podcast in the coming days. All the best and take care.